Welcome to Cochrane's annual general meeting. I'm Juan Franco, an elected member of Cochrane's governing board. Tenemos el agrado de estar aquí con otros miembros del board, líderes del equipo ejecutivo central, líderes y miembros de la red iberoamericana que se encuentran presentes en este hermoso recinto eh, modernista del Hospital San Pablo en Barcelona, donde se está llevando a cabo también la decimoctava reunión Cochrane Iberoamericana. También se encuentran en línea los miembros de nuestra diversa comunidad alrededor del mundo. We have the pleasure to be here with some of our other board members, leadership from the Central Executive Team, and leaders and members of the American Network who are joining us in person here in this beautiful Recinto Modernista of the Hospital San Pau in Barcelona, where the 18th Ibero-American Cochrane meeting is also taking place. We're also joined online by Cochrane members of a diverse community across the world. Estamos muy emocionados de estar aquí y ver a todos en persona. A su vez, también dar cuenta a la comunidad sobre el impacto de Cochrane y su transformación. Les agradecemos de corazón su presencia aquí. Ahora le paso la posta a Catherine Marshall, la copresidenta de la Junta Directiva que va a liderar la sesión. We're very thrilled to see everyone in person again and report to our community about Cochrane's impacts and transformation. We wholeheartedly thank you all for participating in this very important event. Now I will hand over to Catherine Marshall, our governing board co-chair, who will be chairing this session. To you, Catherine. Buenas tardes. And kia ora koutou kato from New Zealand. Uh, I'm Catherine Marshall. I live in New Zealand. I am delighted to have come all the way to Barcelona and to be hosted here by the uh, uh, Ibero-American Cochrane team. Um, it is fantastic to have an AGM in person after all these years, and um, hello to everyone online as well. We have more than 100 people joining us online, so we're having a hybrid event. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, explain the process for this hybrid event. Um, could we click through to the slides, please? Okay, so I'm going to just tell you about the AGM voting procedure. Um, it, well, we're here to report to you, our members, and it's a chance for you to ask us any questions and to hear about the events of the last year. So what we're going to be doing is reporting on our activities, and at the end we'll have a time for some questions. We're also going to be asking you to um, formally vote on our report and our financial statements and our auditor um, arrangements. So there is a chance for you to do some clicking online. So um, we will be um, opening the voting and you can already start voting and please log on to agm at cochrane.org. We'll tell you at the end where the voting is finished. So, for those of you on Zoom, you're going to have your microphone muted. Um, we Please keep your camera off because we want to have really good bandwidth. We'll ask you to show your faces um, towards the end when we've got questions. We'd also encourage you to write written questions in the live chat, in the chat box. Tracy's monitoring all of the chat box and so we'll be able to hear the questions that you've got. You can also get subtitles, if you'd like to have those um, set up on your screen, click on the live transcript and that will be activated. Okay, I'm just going to quickly remind you of the AGM process, of uh, the voting process. It's all electronic, so you need to have access to the internet. Uh, for those of you, you can do it on your smartphones or you might have already chosen to, to vote ahead of time. Um, again, agm.cochrane.org and log in via your Cochrane account to cast your votes on the resolutions. The first thing that we'd like to vote on is the minutes. You'll see on our web page we've loaded three particular documents. Uh, one is the um, trustees report and financial statement and we've also got the minutes there as well so firstly we're going to vote on the minutes this is where we'd like you to do some online clicking 
uh, the resolution proposed by myself and Tracy Howe is to approve the minutes from the last annual general meeting held online on the 27th of October. Could you please vote now? And I'll just wait a minute or two for, well, a second or two for people to vote. Okay, thanks. The next is us reporting to you about our activities. And I'm delighted to have my co-chair, Tracy Howe, here. And Tracy is going to um, give our report. Hello, thank you to everyone joining us online and everyone in the room. Uh, so as Catherine said, this is a joint report from Catherine and myself for the last year. So, as we were all saying, hurry, it's our very first in-person and hybrid meeting in three years. So this AGM is a great opportunity to reconnect with friends and colleagues, and we've been doing that very much in Barcelona here. Reconsider what has changed in the world, and reflect on what we have learned in the last three years, and we're going to report on plans that the board has to build on our strengths to make sure that we're relevant and resilient for our next 30 years. Mm. There we go. So the board met in person last week with the executive leadership team uh, and we spent a number of days really trying to uh, work out the strategy for our way forward. And so the governing board, um, as you recall, are made up of a, a, a number of people. Um, here's some pictures of everyone. I won't go through everyone's names, but most people are in the room today. And we were also joined by two new board members, Gillian Leng from the UK and Wendy Levison from Canada. And we have two outgoing board members, Ray Lam and Marguerite Costa, and we uh, give a vote of thanks to them who have just retired from the board this September. But during the uh, last year, uh, since we last met, uh, Javier Bonfil, uh, who's hosting us today, Nikki Cullum and Carsten Joel Jorgensen also left the board uh, as their terms of office had, were complete. Thank you to everybody who's contributed during that time on the board. And also a big thanks to Judith Brody, who is online with us as well, uh, our interim chief executive. And welcome to Catherine Spencer, who is sitting next to me today as our new chief executive on a permanent basis. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. And you'll be hearing from her shortly. So we've not met in person, but many people have met in person locally. Uh, so Cochrane is, uh, as you know, a very diverse organization. And here are some examples of people meeting from all around the world. Uh, so very active uh, network and community um, crossing many different time zones. And uh, that's probably one of the issues for today for our meeting. So Cochrane membership is growing. It's growing on a daily basis. Um, these are the figures from uh, this week. So oh, almost 13,500 members and just over 98,000 supporters. And as you can see from this uh, global uh, map here, um, we have members and supporters from all around the world. Um, so it's fantastic. We have many more members here, so these are some uh, other examples of people getting together and discussing Cochrane activities. And Cochrane is a welcoming and inclusive organisation. So, as we've said, we're a vibrant organisation of over 100,000 members and supporters. And we celebrate diversity and welcome people with a wide range of life skills, cultural backgrounds, lived experiences and abilities. And our aim is to attract new people to Cochrane. But we need Cochrane to be simpler, to reduce barriers and find ways to be easier to use and work with us. And that's what we spent time doing last week um, as a board, uh, discussing some of these issues. So we did last year um, a listening activity, which was um, 
uh, a very widespread uh, survey and interviews in many different languages and focus groups and these are the things that uh, came out from that. Six out of ten people from all different countries, ages, genders and languages uh, said they didn't feel as included in Cochrane as they wanted. And that's, that's quite a strong message back to us. So we need to change. Those who were not currently involved described difficulties in getting started in Cochrane. Many people describe Cochrane as too centred around English speaking contributions. And our leadership, governance and central team should more closely represent the global and diverse organisation we aspire to be. So to everyone out in the community, um, we have taken those messages on board. We are exploring them and looking at ways to manage those and make Cochrane as inclusive and diverse as possible. So we will be reporting back and there will be a number of initiatives on that uh, as we go through. So we have taken those messages very seriously. Cochrane is uh, accessible um, across the world uh, in many different languages and many people um, on this call will be involved in translating that and pushing information out um, in, in many different ways. So we know that Cochrane's uh, plain language summaries are in 16 different languages and as you can see, the traffic has con continued to grow on our website um, and in the Cochrane Library. So 4 million in uh, 2013 and 84 million in 2020, um, and that's continuing to grow. So we've been supporting the community with events. Uh, we've had regular webinars under the Le Learning Live brand. We've been reintroducing the, or we're going to reintroduce the Cochrane Lecture in uh, November 2022. <laughs> Nearly got that wrong. Uh, early career professional journal clubs and webinars have been very active during this period. And there have no, been a number of regional events and symposia. So these are happening, uh, have been happening during the pandemic. Uh, and obviously now things are opening up as we're able to meet today in person. I'm delighted to announce that there will be a Cochrane Colloquium in London in 2023. We're absolutely excited about this. It's a fantastic opportunity. Everybody's been asking us about when are we having another colloquium. So today we can formally announce it. It is available uh, on the website as an announcement. So please save the date. The dates are there on the screen and we hope you'll all join us. So, the Cochrane Board and the Executive Leadership Team uh, got together last week, and these are the messages that we'd like to give our fantastic community. So, Cochrane is transforming. We have to transform. The world has changed around us. So, our diverse global collaboration will innovate. That's what we want to promote, innovation and sustain our excellence in synthesizing evidence to improve health and care globally. We want to focus on impactful priorities to make evidence available and accessible in a timely and equitable way for people who make decisions about health and care. We want to streamline our processes. We want to embrace technological innovations and advances to enable us to increase skills in evidence synthesis. We've committed to open access publishing and we're working in partnership with many other organisations to enable the sharing of our evidence. So as the speakers uh, continue today, you'll hear more about some of those things that we're doing. I'd also like to announce today a new Emeritus and <coughs> Lifetime Membership Awards. These will be two new forms of membership they're focused on acknowledging people who have made an enormous contribution to Cochrane over many years. So, a lifetime membership award are for those people who've made an extraordinary, long-standing contribution to the organisation. And emeritus members are those who have, uh, have done this but are now leaving uh, Cochrane uh, positions. So, the nominations are now open. The deadline for the first round of nominations is January the 6th next year. We'll announce the new members in March 2023. And we wish to continue this 
uh, program uh, on an annual basis. So if you want to look for the nomination form, go to Cochrane.org, go to join Cochrane, go to membership and the information will be available there. So thank you to all our members and supporters and the staff of Cochrane Groups, the central executive team, the council, all the other committees, everything that everybody is involved in in our fantastic community. Thank you very much. Uh, muchas gracias from Spain. And I think I'm handing over to Karen Kelly, our treasurer, who will give the treasurer's report. Good evening, um, good afternoon and good morning. Um, today I join you as a very happy treasurer and I would like to start by thanking all those many people who work hard to attract funding to our organisation and manage those financial resources very carefully. I'd also like to thank our finance director Casey Early who should be joining us online today and his team for their very careful stewardship of the charity funds. I'll now tell you about our financial results for 2021. And I've just set out a very simple summary there of our income and expenditure for 2021. And we've shown a comparison with the um, income and expenditure in 2020, and also shown you what the budget was for last year. Overall, the financial results were very good for 2021 and we ended the year with a healthy balance sheet. We had planned for a deficit budget of 2.1 million, but the financial performance was better than that and we ended the year with a lower deficit of 1.4 million. You'll see there that the income appears significantly lower than 2020, and that's largely due to the one-off financial benefit in 2020 relating to the new publishing contract with Wiley. Expenditure um, continues to be a bit lower than normal because of the impact of COVID on staff costs and travel, so we saw that in, in both years. The accounts show that the charity ended with free reserves of 4.2 million, in addition to this, the board has actually set up ring-fenced reserves of 4.5 million for strategic investment and to support business continuity through the forthcoming period of change. This level of reserves actually exceeds the level of general reserves expected by the Charities Commission but I would point out that I think we need to be mindful of the fact that income and expenditure account has operated in deficit the last two years and that the programme of change may require further investment. More details of the reserves policy itself and also there are more notes on the accounts which are available on the website. Looking now at 2022, this is just to give you an update on our progress to date. Again, a simple table showing income and expenditure as it was budgeted for this year and what we're currently forecasting. And also in the end column, you can see the actual for last year. The, the, the budget was agreed as a deficit budget um, and we were planning to fund this from reserves. But our current forecasts show that income will actually be higher than, than budget, which puts us in a better position. It's mainly due to the income from the Cochrane Library, but there's also been a substantial uplift in the income in Cochrane response. So congratulations to anyone who's been involved in that. That's, that's um, very good financial performance for this year. All in all, we're expecting that spent expenditure will be broadly on target and we think we will end the, the year round about a break-even position. So that means our free reserves will be around £4.3 million. Pounds. Now, those two slides that I've just gone through are in relation to the, the charity. It doesn't include the finances of the many groups across the world which is brought in and that, that accounts for about 18 million pounds. We recognise that the groups are facing funding challenges and in 2020, Cochrane carried out a financial survey to analyse the main sources of funding and that's what's shown here. The slide shows our top 
10 funders, together with a risk assessment of the continuity of that funding. I do need to add a caveat to the figures that are, that are shown here. For the purposes of comparison of income, the money has been converted into British pounds, but we fully recognise that purchasing power, i.e. how much you get for your pound, will vary from country to country, and we'll, we're seeking to adjust for that in future analysis. But setting that aside, you can see that over two-thirds of our funding comes from the top 10 biggest funders. And one of those is actually Cochrane, but I'd just like to point out that that is actually in return for services. But the two top lines there are the ones that, that should really draw our eyes. Um, they are the largest, NIH are the largest funder by, by quite a distance and they'll be ending most of their funding in March 2023. And there are also some shown there with a medium risk um, that we have, we have some concerns about. So there are, there are financial challenges, um, and we do have to address these global funding challenges. You've, you've heard about the new, the new production model um, and uh, for editorial services, and that will be challenging to deliver. Open access will have a considerable impact on publishing royalties, which up until now have been fairly low risk. There's a need to invest wisely and prudently to deliver change and also to consider new products. And more recently, inflation has been rising uh, at quite a dramatic rate, and that will impact on our cost base. So we do have a variety of plans for addressing these challenges. Um, Tracy made reference to the board strategy meeting this week, and that's been really positive with many opportunities being identified, and those will now be explored in detail. I would say that we are very fortunate as a charity that we've been able to designate funds to support transformational change and income generation. And those designated funds will enable us to invest in fundraising, invest in the development of commercial products, invest in the future of evidence synthesis, and explore options in relation to open access. Our colleagues in finance will be working hard to make sure that funds are invested appropriately, that risks are closely monitored, and that financial outcomes are delivered so that Cochrane can move to a new and sustainable financial model. That ends my, my report. I just want to say a few words about the resolutions which Catherine is about to take us through. The first resolution is is the one on the, the accounts. This is a normal resolution, resolution which you're being asked to receive and note the financial statements. But the, the resolution which follows this is about the appointment of the auditor. But this year it's slightly different because we are in the middle of a tender process to appoint new auditors, but we, we haven't yet completed that process. So we are asking the, the, the AGM to note the reappointment of the existing auditors until we reach the end of that process when the governing board will be asked to appoint a new auditor based on the outcome of that tender process. Catherine. Thanks very much, Karen. Thanks very much, Karen and Tracy. Um, I'd like to move to these resolutions and to voting on them. Uh, the first resolution is proposed by Karen and Tracy, uh, seconded by Tracy, to receive and note the trustees report and financial statements for the year ended 31 December 2021. Could you formally vote? We have already quite a few uh, votes online, um, but we would be delighted if those who can can vote right now. Thank you. And then we'll move to the um, auditor vote. As Karen was saying, uh, we would like to propose that we note the reappointment of Sayer Vincent as auditors until the conclusion of the tender process and the appointment of new auditors. This is proposed by Karen Kelly and seconded by Tracy Howe, and I invite you to vote now. Thank you very much. 
Um, that was the uh, more formal part of the meeting, and um, it's now a pleasure to invite Bob De La Valle to report on the, from the council. Um, and I'll pass over to Bob, who will be talking on behalf of himself and Stefano Negrini. Thank you very much, Catherine. It is a distinct honor and pleasure to be in this beautiful hospital with these wonderful hosts here at the Ibero American Center. And it's been a tremendous pleasure to be meeting with the former and present council members who have been able to make this meeting. I am here today speaking on behalf of the co-chairs. I am one of the two co-chairs. I come from Denver, Colorado, and I represent the coordinating editors. And the other co-chair is Stefano Negrini, who represents the fields on council. So the purpose of the Cochrane Council is to provide a voice to the membership, an effective voice that echoes with the leadership. The voice is to consider high-level matters and to provide input to the governing board. These are your council members. There are nine entities that are represented on council, including the authors, which is the largest group represented on the council of more than 11,000 authors, currently represented by Vanessa Jordan. There are consumers, coordinating editors, early career professionals, fields, geographic groups, information specialists, managing editors, and methods groups. There is currently an election going on for the second position on the council representing authors. There are two representatives for each of those other groups. And please take a look, council, Google, Cochrane Council to find out more about your voice and representation in Cochrane. We want to thank the outgoing members from Cochrane Council. Uh, these include Lottie Hooft, uh, Maria Inti Mesendorf, Sarah Nevitt, and Augustine Ciponi, who is here at this meeting. We thank you for your hard work over the years. The connections between council and the board have increased. The communications have increased in recent years, and that has been purposeful. Council meetings now include the board co-chairs and board meetings, including the recent board strategy meeting, have included the council co-chairs. We will work to increase these communication connections further in the coming year. And we look forward to the colloquium in London with the chance for the full board and the full council to meet once again in person at that meeting. Contributions in 2022 include monitoring the morale of the Cochrane community, giving input on the future of evidence synthesis plan, as well as giving feedback on the rollout of the new editorial management system. The co-chairs of uh, the council have hosted Cochrane Connects, the November internet forum. And we've also provided additional operational feedback with co-chairs of the board and council meeting in between the meetings of the board and council. You can't over-communicate in this job. There has been additional contributions to the membership and awards committee by Liz Dooley, to the Future of Evidence Synthesis Oversight Committee by Vanessa Jordan and Stefano Negrini, to the Editorial Integrity and Efficiency Project by Vanessa Jordan, and to the CEO Selection Interview Committee, and to the Cochrane Board Strategy meeting by Stefano and me. And we've been honored to give that. Our priorities for 2023 are to continue to improve communications, to uh, be involved in the 30th anniversary and colloquium, to work on a council roadmap that will 
mirror and echo the transformation of Cochrane itself so that representation remains appropriate and to give feedback on the transformation itself that Cochrane is undergoing. So I thank you for this opportunity to address the membership and it is my distinct honor and privilege and pleasure now to introduce our new CEO, Catherine Spencer. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, it's fantastic to be here. We've had a wonderful week in Spain already, and we're really delighted to be here with those of you in the room, and very grateful for those of you joining us online as well. Uh, so as new, a new Chief Executive Officer, I was attracted to Cochrane to be part of building the future. Uh, and I was really drawn into public health when I worked at ICDDRB in Dhaka in Bangladesh. And I'm thrilled to be using what I learned there to, at Cochrane to ensure evidence is more accessible and more equitable. This year has been focused on setting the foundation for transformation. We've done this through the strategy for change. This has been an extremely challenging process. And I am very grateful to my colleagues in the central executive team and the Cochrane community for their perseverance to create the right environment for success. The review and reorganization of, of Cochrane will make us more efficient and streamlined and will position us for a more equitable and open access future. Alongside the commitment to open access comes our investment in fundraising to diversify our income and to increase sustainability. My job as CEO at this AGM is to report on the progress against our targets. But of course, I'm pretty new in post, and next year I certainly look forward to reporting on the progress I have delivered with you, the community. But this year, we've built on the success of what we learned responding to COVID-19, which I think we all agree was very impressive. And we've rolled out a new web-based version of our bespoke writing tool for Cochrane Reviews, RevMan Web, which has many new features, including study-centric data and support for methodology. And we've implemented the new editorial management system. And finally, Cochrane Crowd, our citizen science platform has passed over 23,000 contributions. Among our advocacy activities, we held a World Health Assembly side event together with the Evidence Commission featuring national health ministers and the WHO chief scientist, Dr. Swamin Athon, in May 2022. In 2021, an astonishing 76% of new WHO guidelines were informed by evidence from Cochrane Reviews. And our World Evidence-Based Healthcare Day, in conjunction with partners, was such a success and preparations are already well underway, which you've probably seen, for the next one on the 20th of October, so coming very soon. Cochrane groups continue to advocate for Cochrane activities and goals, and I really look forward to learning more over the next few months. 75% of all Cochrane reviews were, and still are, free to access globally. All COVID-19 related reviews continue to be made free access. Teams in different countries continue to translate and disseminate Cochrane evidence into 15 languages. We can congratulate all elements of our community for an astonishing 30 years. Our contribution to improving health has been exceptional. And here we are in Spain celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Spanish Cochrane Center, 
And next year, we'll celebrate the 30th anniversary of Cochrane um, at the colloquium, among other events. Cochrane is transforming so that as a community, we can achieve even more. Our move to full open access is essential, and we're working hard on a new business model to ensure we can meet our commitment and secure the future of Cochrane. Cochrane remains vital, and that's why we're undergoing change, a transformation to face the future, where we'll be more agile, and in the coming months, we will clarify um, the direction of travel as we develop our next strategy. We see an inclusive future, improving on equity and recognizing that we can play a vital part to achieve more in world health. This includes contributing to achieve the sustainable development goals and really understanding what our users need. Cochrane has evolved as a very special network of experts, contributing enormously to a very wide range of topics. We will harness the expertise of our community to ensure that together we can achieve more and provide even greater value to world health. We'll identify need areas of most need and ensure that we have the evidence to support the most crucial questions that can help improve world health. And we'll collaborate more closely with partners to ensure that we achieve outcomes that matter. We know that we can encourage more people to be involved in Cochrane if we simplify our processes, which is why our focus is on ensuring that Cochrane including Cochrane Reviews, are more straightforward while continuing to, continuing to deliver the very best quality. We know that we can deliver better if we simplify. We will release our potential to mirror the success that we have already had in ensuring that the reliable and credible evidence is produced and used in more local settings. And of course, with all these goals, with the need to ensure that we reach open access completely and the global economic challenges the world is facing, we'll require greater income diversification. To achieve this, we have point appointed our new development director, Gavin Adams, who will focus on better communication, fundraising, and our membership. Happily, we have a very long list of potential prospects to attract funding and an internal and external community who recognize that to enable open access, the need to develop new income streams is vital. And finally, muchas gracias, thank you. Um, I really look forward to working with all of you and helping us develop that brilliant future for Cochrane, building on our success. Uh, and I hope over the next few months, I'll get a chance to meet even more of you. But thank you very much for what has been a very warm welcome so far. I'm gonna hand over now to my excellent colleague, um, who's among those who's made me feel incredibly welcome. So I'm very thankful to her, to uh, Editor-in-Chief, Carla suarez Visor. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, buenas tardes a todos que están aquí. A good morning, good evening, or good afternoon uh, for those of you attending online. Uh, I'm hoping that, as Catherine Marshall said, next year we all meet and have this face to face because it has been explained to have this morning a face to face full house and talking to my colleagues and friends. So thank you for this. And what I'd like to talk to you is continue the conversation about the difference we make. Um, we have been uh, 
developing our new strategy and working in a number of areas in the past couple of years, but it's really important for us all to look back and see what we have contributed towards these years. And I want to focus in three key areas. One is producing and publishing evidence in the Cochrane Library. The second one is setting method standards and support authors. And the third one, transforming the way we produce evidence centers. And here I pause to thank all my colleagues from the Cochrane Central Editorial Team, a Central Executive Team, but also across the world. There has been a lot of people talking to us, advising and participate on this process with us. So just an acknowledgement that this is a journey that we all take in together. And it has been an interesting journey. So in 2020, we published over 800 reviews and protocols. In 2021, we published 501 new reviews and updates and 255 protocols. And so far in 2022, we published 291 reviews and 186 protocol. But we also seen during this period the, uh, our impact factor growing from 7.89 to 12. So these are all our collective efforts for, uh, that, and, and the, the reviews that we produce and the impact that we make. But we all know that impact is also about people. And, uh, and I'd like to point out the contribution of many of you to all of this. So there are 848 authors in the Ibero-American, and throughout the years, they've contributed 500 reviews and 126 protocols. It's a pr fantastic achievement, and I'm very grateful to be here talking to you today. However, Cochrane is much more than Cochrane Reviews. So you have nearly 500 people as crowd citizens. You have translators, early career professionals, consumer network, and methods network. So the Ibero America is really part of the big family, and it contributes in all the areas of Cochrane. The other thing that is very important, over the years we have been increased the number of reviews that were not reviews of uh, comparing different interventions. And these reviews have shown that it really, they are impactful. So diagnosed test accuracy reviews, 70% of them have been cited in guidelines. The, our network meta-analysis, 60% of them have been used in guidelines prognosis, qualitative and, and, and reviews, and living systematic reviews. But overall, of our 8,900 current published reviews in the Cochrane Library, 6,362 have been cited in at least one guideline. This means 71% of all the reviews in the Cochrane Library. And this is, again, an achievement of all of us. And this is just one example Recently, uh, the pregnancy and childbirth has worked with the World Health Organization and, and to all the reviews to inform these five guidelines were Cochrane reviews. So again, uh, partners and, and, and the organizations making decisions for health, we use our evidence to support the, the, the the information because they know that our evidence is of quality. So again, our work is being recognized. But there are other areas that we would like to contribute. And I think we need to all think about this transformation that Trace has mentioned, Catherine has mentioned, as something that will create new opportunities for us. We know, for example, that the issue about climate health is a very important issue at the moment. So uh, a group of, of members of the organization created a working group, and they're working scoping the questions that they think is relevant for Cochrane to move ahead and try to identify ways to produce the reviews. We have also had uh, a, a very important discussions with the sustainable healthcare field. And again, members of the organization were involved, including Juan. 
uh, on making wise choice about low value healthcare during the COVID pandemic. These work are work that we are now thinking how we can use this type of, of, of work and identify areas that we actually could stop doing, not only the areas that we should be working towards implement, but the areas that we could stop in, uh, doing going forward. And you've heard a number of times about Cock and Convince. Uh, some of the actions uh, on Cock and Convince was that one of the key area of uh, during COVID that influenced the use of evidence was the inequity. So some parts of the world couldn't be sitting on the table and didn't have the same tools and skills to sit on the table. We are very seriously looking at that. We are working with uh, organizations such as the World Health Organization. Tomorrow I will leave you for, for 24 hours to be able to join a, a group of people in Berlin that are going to talk about how do we finance and how do we improve capacity, uh, strength capacity in low income settings. And Cochrane is on the table to discuss with these main uh, key leaders in this area. So there are a number of challenges. And again, I'd like to, to, to reassure all of you that we are all working towards making or op creating opportunities based on these challenges. Not that the challenges we, you know, are easy, but I think that they generate opportunities for us as well. And just going forward, uh, methods, Cochin has always been uh, recognized as a standard setter for methods. And I'd like to remind that on the back of all of what we're trying to do now, there is a small team in Cochrane led by Professor Lisa Barrow working on research integrity. This has been a tremendous issue during COVID pandemic, uh, including our most cited review, the Ivermectin review that is very much based on, on, how, on research issues with the primary studies. Um, and and the, we created a policy to identify and a group of members of the community have now uh, received a small grant to, and the idea of this grant is to create a list of red flags in terms of research integrity. It's a complex issue, but we are working with other partners and trying to set standards and policy on this area because we think and we know it's very, very important that the quality we produce is based on, 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 on quality primary studies as well. And we're increasing the family of cock and handbooks. So uh, early in 2023, we will launch our Diagnostic Accuracy Handbook. It's really being in the, in the, at the oven at the moment. It's really nearly baked. And we have signed contracts for uh, uh, a handbook in qualitative evidence synthesis and another handbook on prognosis reviews. So we want to create a series of handbooks and also create uh, work with the methods group to create guidance that support our authors when they are developing these different types of reviews. And for those of you that have not heard this news yet, we also launched a new uh, open access journal called Cochrane Evidence Synthesis and Methods and led by Professor Mike Brown. Mike is a, is a long-term contributor of Cochrane. He has been the senior lead, uh, editor of two of our networks, and uh, the journal will open four submissions from November 2022, and any of you that would like to know more, I'm more than happy to provide more details. And last but not least, You've heard a lot about uh, our transformation. And I think it's very important for all us to think, what do we want and where do we want to get? So to me, three key areas that I would like to work with you and lead the organization through is to streamline system and process, improve our author experience, and increase diversity in the organization. And ultimately, the vision of this transformation is to better respond to import global health and social care needs, 
streamline and simplify our evidence synthesis development and achieve long-term sustainability. And here, I'm making an announcement as part of the future of evidence synthesis of the, three, the, the new thematic groups. We went through a process, we've asked for applications. There were eight applications. These were assessed for, by a panel of 10 independent people uh, internally and external to Cochrane, but in the area of evidence synthesis, including Eva, I don't know if Eva is here, but she, is part of, she was part of the panel as well. Thank you very much. And the panel decided uh, that three of these applications uh, were ready to, to go forward, and with another four that we needed more clarification before we, we, we give a final decision. So the three ones, the three thema first thematic groups in, in this transformation is about nutrition and physical activity, led by members of the Cock in South Africa, public health and health system, led by, by the coordinating editors of the EPOC group, and health equity, led, led by a group of people in Canada, including Jordi Pardo. So congratulations to all of you. It was amazing to see all the applications and to see the community getting together to, to, to support this process. So thank you and congratulations. But more than anything, I would like to thank all the community that produced our reviews. In 1995, the first issue of the Cochrane database of systematic reviews had 36 Cochrane reviews and 16 protocols. Now, we have over 16,000 Cochrane reviews and over 11,000 protocols. This is the difference you make, and I'm very grateful and thankful on behalf of Cochrane. Gracias. Thank you very much, Carla and Catherine and Bob. I think um, you've heard a rich, uh, exam rich examples of the things that we've been doing as an organisation, uh, both from the central executive team and more widely in the community. Um, and this is where the party starts, because we've got um, the next um, section of this meeting is to acknowledge some special people who've made individual contributions. And it's also a chance for you to meet um, another four members of our board. So I'll hand over to Juan Franco uh, to start the party. Gracias, Catherine. Bueno, sí, estas son las partes favoritas de la reunión, los premios y los galardones. Tenemos miles de miembros alrededor del mundo que contribuyen al éxito de la organización. Todos hacen que Cochrane eh, tenga éxito. Y acá tenemos la oportunidad de destacar a los miembros sobresalientes. This is one of my favorite parts of the AGM, Cochrane's Awards and Prizes. We have thousands of uh, members across the world contributed to this thriving organization. It will all make Cochrane happen. And we have the opportunity to highlight those outstanding members. El primer premio es el Kenneth Warren Prize. Eh, los detalles de la historia están en la página de Conquering Community eh, y el, el primer galardón fue en el año 2000 y el panel evaluador está compuesto por nacionales de países de vías de desarrollo. Y ahora escucharemos al doctor Eke que proveerá los detalles sobre el premio y anunciará a la persona de la ordenada. The first prize is the Kenneth Warren Prize. The full details are on the Conquering Community website and uh, the first recipient was in the year 2000 and the judgment panel is comprised entirely by nationals of development countries. We'll listen to Dr. Eke, who will provide further details on the prize and the announcement of the recipient. My name is Dr. Ahize Chuku Eke. I am an associate professor of maternal fetal medicine with the Department of Gynecology and Obstetrics at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States. I am highly privileged to be the chair of the selection committee for the 2022 Kenneth Warren Prize. This prize honors the work of Kenneth Warren, who was instrumental in drawing attention to neglected diseases from developing countries and in the dissemination of health research, especially through the electronic media. The Kenneth Warren Prize is awarded annually by Cochrane to the principal author of a published Cochrane review that is judged to be of very high methodological quality and relevant to the health problems of developing countries. 
the 2022 Kenneth Warren Prize has been awarded to Dr. Eleanor Ochodo for her Cochrane Review titled Point of Care Tests Detecting HIV Nucleic Acids for the Diagnosis of HIV-1 or HIV-2 Infection in Infants and Children Aged 18 Months or Less. Congrats, Dr. Ochodo. Hi, my name is Eleanor Ochodo Okondo. I'm a medical doctor and research scientist based in Kenya at the Kenya Medical Research Institute. I also have a joint affiliation with Stellenbosch University, South Africa as an Associate Professor Extraordinary of Clinical Epidemiology. I am highly passionate about evidence-based diagnostics. My first Cochrane review was a diagnostic test accuracy review. Diagnostics are very important, yet they tend to have low visibility and prioritization, especially in low-middle-income country settings. So this award means so much to me as it recognizes diagnostics and diagnostic test accuracy reviews for that matter, especially by authors based in low-income settings. Thank you so much for the nomination and selection. I am so happy. Hi everyone, my name is Emma Prasad. I am a governing board member. Um, I'm here to present the end. Hello, Anderson. I'm Jackie Hope from Malaysia. <laughs> the Ann Anderson Award. Um, so the Ann Anderson Award recognizes a female member of Cochrane who has made a significant contribution to the enhancement and visibility of women's participation within Cochrane. The award recipient each year leaves her legacy by assisting a woman from a low resource setting with her Cochrane activities. And now I will leave it to last year's recipient, Jackie Ho, to report on what she's done with the award and announce this year's recipient. Hello, I'm Jackie Hope from Malaysia. Around this time last year, I was totally caught by surprise when I received an email from Malaysia Uni for being awarded the 2021 Anne Anderson Award. I was absolutely delighted. It's shown me something I never knew about myself, and that is that at heart, I'm a mentor, and I've been mentoring all my life. Without the Anne Anderson Award, I might never have come to realize this. So again, I thank Prof. Sumant, who nominated me, and the 2020 who voted for me. I donated the prize money to Wai Ching Fung, and she has used it to develop a website on kangaroo mother care for Malaysian mothers. The Cochrane Review on Kangaroo Mother Care provides evidence that it not only reduces mortality in preterm infants, but has other important benefits. So this is why the World Health Organization has endorsed it as an essential care. We plan that the website will be in the three main languages used in Malaysia. And Wai Ching will be launching it on World Prematurity Day in November this year. So I believe that this website um, will not only help to save the lives of preterm babies, but will also empower women uh, as mothers by helping them to provide this essential care for their baby. So now we come to the 2022 Anne Anderson Award, and I have the privilege of announcing it. I'm delighted to announce that it will go to Tiffany Decay. She's the perfect choice. Congratulations, Tiffany. And luckily, Tiffany is here, so. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm glad I get to do this in person and not the horrible video that I sent in before. So <laughs> Thank you so much. I, like Jackie, we were thrilled was and honored to see the 2022. To receive an email from the selection committee from Bob Dilavalli. Um, announcing that I had been selected. It's, it's really such an incredible honor to be considered as part of the legacy of Ann Anderson, who spent her incredible career caring mostly for mothers. My career has also been mostly based in maternal and child health, so I feel so honored to not only be able to represent this award, but then to be able to pay it forward is, is just really incredible. Um, it will be such an honor to pay it forward. I think the decision of who to 
to, to give it to will be very difficult. There are certainly hundreds, if not thousands, of women in Cochrane who are as deserving of this award as me. So I really look forward to participating and collaborating with someone. Um, I've had the opportunity through geographic groups and the mentoring program that I started to really get to know a lot of amazing, dedicated, motivated, wonderful women and men and everybody in Cochrane. And I, I just wanna thank Cochrane and the CET for really giving me such a place to shine and grow. And it's really been such a privilege to be here and to know all of you and work with all of you. Um, and if someone had told me five years ago or even three years ago, oh, you'll be working at Cochrane and you'll win an award, there's no way I would have believed it. So <laughs> this is just really great and thank you so much to all of you. And I look forward to being able to tell everyone um, who the prize will, will go to in the future. The Chris Szilagyi Prize has been continuously awarded since 2002, and it is my great pleasure to present the 20th Chris Szilagyi Prize. Many of you will know that every year when I do this, I nearly cry. The prize is awarded in honour of the late Chris Szilagyi, the inaugural director of Cochrane Australia. Nominations are made by peers and selected by a panel of past recipients. This year's prize is awarded to two individuals nominated together. To quote from their nomination, nominating one without the other would be unthinkable, like celebrating a stair without Rogers, since their work has synergised, complementing each other perfectly over many, many years. Recognising extraordinary and sustained contribution to Cochrane, this year's Chris Szilagyi Prize goes to Claire Jess and Gail Quinn. We are both thrilled and honoured to receive the 2022 Chris Szilagyi Award. We have witnessed this prize being awarded numerous times and the fact that it is given to recognise extraordinary contributions within Cochrane is a gesture which resonates with us both and is a wonderful reflection on Chris Szilagyi himself. We would also like to acknowledge his family and supporters for ensuring this award continues in his memory. We have had an extraordinary journey over the past 18 years and it is the people we have met and worked with during this time which has made it so. Our close group colleagues, Joe Morrison, Robin Grant, Mike Hart, our past coordinating editor, Chris Williams, Joe Platt and Tracy Harrison, as well as all our national and international friends, colleagues and author teams have made the years working with our group so rewarding, both personally and professionally. It has been more than a job in many ways and always a team effort. The events over the past two years or so have been very challenging for us all. So this honour comes at a time when significant change lies ahead for our group. And consequently, this Cherish Award has given us a huge morale boost. We'd like to thank all those past and present who have supported us over our time with Cochrane, and in particular, our managing editor colleagues, whom we have shared so much with, lots of hard work and lots of fun too. Thank you once again from the both of us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm still a bit touched with Kayla and, and Queen, sorry, and Claire. Okay, uh, el precio Bill Silverman se entregó por primera vez en 2008 y se ofrece anualmente. The Bill Silverman Prize was awarded for the first time in 2008 and it's awarded annually. It explicitly acknowledged Cochrane's value of criticism with a view to help improving our work. El precio, el, el precio Bill Silverman explícitamente reconoce la apreciación que Cochrane da a las críticas con el objetivo de mejorar nuestro trabajo. Unfortunately, none of the submissions met the inclusion criteria this year. Desafortunadamente, ninguno de los envíos cumplió los criterios de inclusión este año. La crítica constructiva es fundamental para el desarrollo de la ciencia. 
Les animamos a enviar sugerencias y artículos para ayudar a Cochrane a cumplir su objetivo de conseguir mejores decisiones informadas. Constructive criticism is essential to the development of science. We encourage you to make submissions of papers that help Cochrane to do better on their objective to achieve better informed decision making. Thank you very much, Geordie. Um, I think it is fantastic to have these awards, and we encourage people to make submissions and proposals for next year, and um, overall, our tremendous congratulations to the award winners tonight and, well, today. Thank you very much for everything you've done. It is uh, now for me to announce that we are closing the voting on those um, three resolutions, and it's a chance for us to invite people to uh, the questions part of this meeting. One of the questions that we've already had is how many people are here in Barcelona, and I'm guessing that it's around 40 people at the moment? In the room? Oh, and the um, Ibero American meeting has had over 200 people during the day and over the next couple of days. We've also got 200 people online for those of you he who are here, so we've got uh, a, a really great attendance. Um, so the first question that we've got from an online, and I'd like to do it so that we do an online and a question from the, the people in the room, is for Carla about the new journal. Yeah, so the question, sorry. Um, the question is about the new Away journal, what we'll publish and what's the difference from the Cochrane database system at reviews. I'll start with the latter. You know, we've done a lot of strategic discussion, including with Cochrane's editorial board. Uh, our view is that the Cochrane database of systematic review is and will continue to be our premium database, and we're looking at ways that we look at reviews, at systematic reviews of high impact, high quality, that many times, as we know, they are, uh, they take longer to produce because they need to, 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 to be much more, they're much bigger. The journal, in terms of systematic reviews, we're looking at evidence gaps or scoping reviews, uh, but obviously they, they have, um, the new editorial board of the journal has met for the first time, so it's a bit too early to define exactly what type of systematic reviews the new journal will publish. A second big focus of the new journal is on methods studies. Cochrane has a lot of methods groups and produce a number of, uh, of uh, 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 articles, methods articles that are usually published elsewhere. So we want this to be an opportunity for the community to participate. And if you have any ideas or discussions, please don't hesitate to contact us because we want to hear from you as well. Thank you. Um, there's a, just a follow-up. Kuhala, uh, can student members contribute to the new journal as reviewers or editors? Yes, um, the editor will have uh, uh, early career profession as an editor, but to also have consumers, we have methodologists. Um, I cannot, I don't know exactly the composition of the, of the current editorial board because the first meeting, as I said, was yesterday, but this will all be announced and be online from early November. Are there any questions from the room? We do have quite a, um, a number coming through so um, from online. So one question that um, we have had about the membership is whether people can get a physical pin for being a Cochrane member. Um, it's certainly one of the things that we've been talking about in the um, membership committee that we run. Uh, just uh, for a vote of hands here, would people be interested in having a, a lapel pin or, or something like that? Geordie <laughs> would. Okay, we'll get we'll get a couple made. Oh, thank you, uh, Catherine. Um, you've got a question there about um, the open access agenda. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Uh, so as, I, as we've mentioned, open access is something that we want to achieve and we've committed to achieve that by the end of 2025 for our systematic reviews. Um, I mean, in terms of agenda, I think that's part of a, a bigger uh, push to ensure that even more of our evidence is available to more people and that will be combined as well with even more knowledge translation work, which we're already really good at, um, but making sure that um, across the full spectrum of users that people are able to easily access our reviews. Um, and I think open access, as you'll see within the publishing community, is an evolving story. Uh, so we will, it's something that we will continue to develop. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, one of the other questions that follows on from that, uh, that we've had from online, is how are we working with governments to gain funding? Um, this is an area where we're developing a strategy at the moment. Um, we have some new staff coming on board and new trustees who are going to work with us to develop um, an approach to develop materials for working with government and to come up with some really um, appealing um, proposals that will help them want to fund our work. So uh, our work is going to be um, planning in the next six months and uh, we hope to be able to report back to you at the next meeting on the way our um, funding has gone with new government proposals. Carla, you've got another question there. Yeah, the question is whether there are... I can speak very loud and <laughs> the question is uh, whether there are going to be more rounds of application for thematic groups. Um, yes, the first step, and that's what we started this process with, is to identify five or six out of the current eight applications. So as I mentioned, for four applications, we are at the moment asking for clarification. And by early November, we will announce the, fa the, 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 the full five or six applications for thematic groups. And we intend to pilot to learn from each other because there are some things that we, you know, we need to clarify. And our goal is that throughout this strategy is to have the 20 thematic groups. We also work and start working on applications that we hope to be able to, to, submit, to start to send to the community by early next year of evidence synthesis units. So the process is just starting. And as we mentioned many times, this process to be completed is going to be through three to five years. So a number of these, these things will repeat itself. But it's important for us that we start with a smaller number so that we can adjust and make sure that we, we continue work with our values. Thank you. Thanks very much, Carla. Um, if you have any questions, please wave your hand frantically and we'll um, come to you. We've got quite a few opinions coming in online on um, the PIN. There are some concerns about the trade-off be between um, environmental issues with producing something that might be uh, short-lived um, and use scarce resources. Um, at the risk of um, in encouraging shopping, uh, we do have some fantastic merch on the website that you might like to look at if you feel in need of a Cochrane t-shirt, a Cochrane bag, um, and a Cochrane cup would really set that off nicely. So uh, please have a look and um, keep your comments coming. Um, there are some also some quite technical questions uh, coming through online, and we'll be putting the answers to those questions up on the website over the next couple of weeks. So um, we'll get back to the technical experts who can give us those um, answers that you're looking for. Um, Tracy, anything else? Tracy's been uh, just rolling through all of the questions, so thank you very much for that. Um, consumer involvement, can we improve how we, can, how we engage with consumers? And um, I think that is one of our challenges. 
Carla, can you talk a little bit about some of the thinking that has gone into the um, ways you're wanting to engage consumers in the new journal, for example? Yeah, I mean, I can see that the questions were all for me this time. Huh? <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the new journal we made, we wanted to, to have, as I, as I mentioned, uh, consumers as part of the editorial board, but this is not only about the new journal. We have uh, made change on Cochrane's editorial board, and the Cochrane editorial board has an um, early career representative. She's sitting here with us today, and, uh, but also have consumer uh, representative. And part of what we are trying to do is to work out areas. I mean, I know that there is a major interest, for example, on co-production. And there is an interest from our side and from many members of the consumer network as well. And we're trying to identify ways that we can start piloting these ideas and can create mechanisms that uh, we can go, going forward, you know, be more active on these areas. Part of what the challenge is for, for us now is that the focus is very much being on create the foundation for these changes. And the, by this I mean, you know, establishing and scaling up a central editorial service, reduce the format of reviews, and create efficiencies that will allow us to uh, uh, improve, efficient, if, uh, improve on, on innovations. So we are very mindful that there is much more to do, and we are working with the editorial board and the community to deliver on these things. Thanks very much, Carla. I think we're all really keen to have more consumer engagement. It's something that um, we know works, um, makes a difference to the kinds of um, information we produce, and we're also looking at formats which um, are more appealing to consumers, and we need consumers to advise us on how to do that. Um, one of the new questions that's just come through is um, about the things that we might stop doing or the things we'll do less of. Um, and I think, Carla, you've already talked a little bit about the things that we want to improve and streamline so they're not as uh, time-consuming, onerous, and complex. Um, both Catherine and Carla and Tracy have talked about how we want to become a simpler organisation that is easy to engage with. Um, but Catherine, can you pick up on some of the other things that um, we've been talking about over the last week um, that might mean that we do things differently? Yeah, thank you, Catherine. I mean, it's a really good question, which I know has come from Martin Burton. So thank you, Martin. Um, and in terms of what we can stop doing, I think it's really important to say that we have already stopped doing some things. Um, so during that restructure process, there were things that were stopped do that we we are doing differently. So knowledge translation, for example, which um, we've put in place a process to encourage Cochrane groups um, to do more knowledge translation. I know there are some really excellent people working in that area. But part of the process over the next few months as we look at our strategy is to really ask ourselves which activities we must do um, and are there areas which actually maybe not stop doing but also in terms of transforming, ensuring that we have a time frame which doesn't exhaust our, our colleagues in the central executive team and across Cochrane. Uh, we're really aware that the last um, few, last 18 months I think have been incredibly um, tiring for people as we work out that pace of change. Uh, so I think it's going to be a case of understanding which activities, which of course are often quite interrelated, we can um, remove, um, but also if there are activities we need to do to move forward, the pace at which we do them needs to be really carefully considered. Thanks very much, Catherine. And um, just to pick up on uh, one of the comments that has come through, um, and I think is completely endorsed by the board, that the consumer agenda is not just part of uh, confined activities, it's actually embedded 
in what we do in Cochrane, and we need to show that. We need to make it more apparent, and I think it's something that is really going to be an emphasis for us on the coming um, year. Now, um, we have had the resolutions um, uh, results. Does anyone have any uh, further questions before we move on to that? One last one. Um, and this is um, a, a comment that any changes as we go forward, and we have talked about a, a transformation agenda, things that we need to do differently, things that we want to um, review, refresh. Um, we need to be looking at how we um, impact on all groups and people who participate in Cochrane. We know how hard it has been uh, over the last two years when our whole worlds have changed. Uh, many of us are working in quite different ways than we were three or four years ago. So we need to understand that um, we need to engage with people and find out the best ways that our ideas can be implemented. Um, it's not just about authors, it's about the whole community being engaged and also how we welcome new people into the community. Um, look, we have really enjoyed bringing together this amazing wealth of information about the work of, of the community. And um, it has been fantastic to do this. So uh, I would like to know the results, Roma, that um, we have before we end with a final thank you. Um, pleased to tell you that all results, all resolutions were passed and we can give you more information online. Thank you very much. Behind the scenes we have had um, Roma and Elspeth helping us manage this whole process and, and organising it. So tremendous appreciation for that. Over to you, Jordi. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Well, lástima que terminó la Asamblea General de hoy. Uh, we are really sorry that there is no more AGM uh, today. It has been great to have you all here. Thank you for your uh, hard work, for your questions, and especially for all your enthusiasm for the future. Ha sido fantástico tenerlos hoy a todos aquí. Muchas gracias por su presencia, por sus valiosas contribuciones y especialmente por su entusiasmo por conseguir eh, teniendo una cocra para el futuro. Nos vemos en Londres el año que viene. See you all in London next year. Thank you everyone for coming. It is so good to have uh, real people in the room together. It has been a great AGM. And thanks to everyone, uh, the 200 people or so, who joined online from all kinds of countries at all kinds of hours. Thank you all for participating. And we look forward to seeing you in London next year, as Geordie says. Adios.